Hello and welcome to this little island amid the ocean that YouTube is. In part 1, we observed the relations between previous Ruse lands and the growing Grand Duchy of Lithuania. With the changes introduced by the Union of Lublin, we watched the deterioration of said relations and perhaps, most importantly, a shift in how Ruse lands and priests see themselves. On today's video, we will explore how the Commonwealth development and religious identity may have culturally impacted today's Ukraine. The economic strength that the Commonwealth had helped the nobility expand its privileges and political influence. In the late 15th and early 16th centuries, the Slota gained control of the local assemblies and somewhat later of the Sejma, the General Assembly of the Commonwealth, which possessed the highest legislative and executive authority in the land. In 1505, the noble-controlled Sejma passed the Nihil Novi Law, which forbade the king to pass any new edict without the consent of the nobles' representatives. And in 1573, after the Zagiolian dynasty died out, the Slota gained the right to elect its monarchs and to define their prerogatives by means of a contractual arrangement called the Pacta Conventa. The towns were another target of the nobles' aggrandizing tendencies. Viewing them as their comerical rivals, the nobles did their best to undermine them. In 1505, they deprived most of the towns of voting rights in the Sejma. Unable to withstand the pressure from the noble-dominated countryside, many townsmen decided to join it. A major reason why the lower nobility of the Grand Principality supported the union with Poland was that it wished to obtain rights similar to those of the Polish Slota. Even a change of religion was encouraged because Polish law stipulated that a nobleman who adopted Catholicism would automatically receive the rights of a Polish nobleman. Between 1500 and 1600, the growing influx of silver and gold from the New World rushed the economy and with it the population quickly rose. Consequently, so did the food price. As the crowded cities of the West clamored for wheat, the landowners of Eastern Europe, especially those of the vast Commonwealth, responded. Ever-increasing shipments of grain flowed from the northern and central areas of the Commonwealth. Meanwhile, in the southern regions of the Commonwealth, such as Podilia, out of reach of the Vistula River route, great herds of cattle were raised and driven to the southern Germany and Italy. The Great East European food rush, in which Ukraine was to play a very prominent role, was on. To produce food more efficiently and in greater quantities, nobles began to transform their land holdings into commercially-oriented food plantations or estates. It no longer made economic sense for them to collect slowly increasing rents from small, inefficient peasant holdings. Instead, they tried to gain direct control of the peasant lands so as to amalgate them into their estates and, in place of rents, they demanded ever more free labor from their peasants. The boom experience made power concentrate in agriculture while other industries became underdeveloped. At the same time, while nobility conditions increased, the peasant conditions declined. Although not all areas were affected the same way, we find an enservement of the peasantry, who lacked in military and leadership experience to challenge the nobility. Since power, wealth and privilege in the Commonwealth was deeply associated with the Polish, resentment quickly grew within the ones who did not identify with Polish culture. Contrary to what was the expected outcome of the Union of Lublin, it gave greater prominence to Ukrainian princes such as Konstantin Ostrovsky, who was seen as the uncrowned prince of Rus. Not only did they build wealth and appropriated land, but they also started to endeavor in cultural and educational projects. This cultural awakening was fueled by the political aspirations of the princes and directly linked to the religious conflicts of the time. When Rus lands joined Lithuania, there was hope for the church growth as Lithuanian grand princes did not want to leave the numerous orthodox subjects jurisdiction of the Moscow metropolitanate. Orthodoxy became synonymous of culture in the 15th and 16th centuries. With no state of their own, the church served for Ukrainians as the only institutional means of expressing their collective identity. It took place in both sides of the new Polish border. With the establishment of the metropolitanate in Kiev in 1458, the metropolitan broke broke ties with Moscow and returned to the jurisdiction of Constantinople. As for what had been done previously, the Grand Princes and later Kings of Poland acquired the right of patronage, which meant they could appoint Orthodox bishops and even the Metropolitan itself. 
Under Catholic Poland, the fate of orthodoxy was on the hands of an increasingly antagonistic church. The results were disastrous. With lay authorities capable of appointing bishops, the metropolitan authority was undermined. And with every bishop acting as a law unto himself, the organizational discipline of the Orthodox Church deteriorated rapidly. Even more deleterious was the corruption that lay patronage engendered. While Orthodoxy struggled, Poland enjoyed a period of cultural growth, experienced the Renaissance and abandoning medieval preoccupation with the afterlife, with the Reformation period bringing new currents of creativity to the Commonwealth. To spread their ideas more effectively, the Protestants found schools of higher learning, established printing presses, and further developed the use of Polish as a literary language. Despite the intense religious rivalries that evolved in the 16th century, the Commonwealth, unlike most of Europe, remained an oasis of religious tolerance. To a larger extent, this factor was a function of the nobility's tremendous influence, for since the noble's rights were inviolable, his religious views, no matter how different, also had to be respected. Establishing a network of excellent colleges throughout the Commonwealth, the Jesuits not only educated Poles in a militantly Catholic spirit, but also attract talented Protestants and Orthodox youths into their sphere of influence. Slowly, under the impact of the Counter-Reformation, the former religious tolerance of the Commonwealth began to give away to the Catholic fanaticism. The Jesuits argued that the Orthodoxy only option was to unite with Rome, and the Ukrainian nobles eventually drove away from orthodoxy to embrace Catholicism, along with Polish language and culture, as it became clearer that much of their status depended on it. Traditional ways still survived among pockets of the poor gentry, which lived in isolated areas far from the centers of Polish culture. However, they were politically, socially and economically too weak to stem the process of Polonization. The loss of the elite would have a profound impact on the future identity of society. In the hierarchically structured societies of early modern Europe, for a people to be without the nobility was a tantamount to being a body without the heads. It meant that Ukrainians were left without the class that normally provided political leadership and purpose, patronized culture and education, supported the church, and endowed the society with a sense of ethnopolitical identity. As the elite moved closer to Polish influence, orthodoxy, language and customs specific to the Rus' descendants became increasingly associated with the lower class. Without support from the ones who held the power, magnates who still followed orthodoxy invested in schools and in the printing press of their estates. There are indications that in 1570, Prince Yuri Siutsky founded a school and printing press on his estate. Support was also forthcoming from the energetic Prince Andriy Kurbsky, a Moscovite defector who settled in Volhynia in 1570 and devoted himself to the defense of orthodoxy. But the most widely recognized and important patron of the Orthodox Church was the uncrowned king of Ukraine, Prince Konstantin Ostrowski, one of the richest and most powerful magnates in the Commonwealth. In 1578, Konstantin Ostrowski established a printing press on his estate at Ostry in Volhynia. There, Ivan Fedorov worked and published the Ostry Bible in 1581, the first printed Bible in Slavic. Ostrowski also found schools and in 1580, the Ostry Academy with a curriculum that matched the best Jesuit schools. As the Academy reputation grew, so did the number of intellectuals it produced. Nonetheless, its success was deeply rooted on its benefactor, Konstantin Ostrowski, since support remained weak. When he died, one of his granddaughters, Anna, who was a devout Catholic, gave the academy to the Jesuits. Nonetheless, another important defender of religio-cultural identity were the townsmen, often merchants and craftsmen, with later rich merchants as their influence grew, who banded together with organizations called Brotherhoods. Historians speculate that these Brotherhoods originated in medieval times for the purpose of maintaining churches, supplying them with candles, icons and books. Probably influenced by guilds, they adopted an organizational pattern that included annual elections of officers, mandatory monthly meetings, payments of dues and communal courts. They gained popularity and respect by engaging in such activities as caring for the widows and orphans of deceased members, supporting hospitals and providing members with interest-free loans. By the 16th century, the most important and influential brotherhood was the one associated with Dormition Cathedral in Lviv. Yet the brotherhoods accepted members from all social status, and depending on their region, their membership although not large, could vary significantly on who could be found in it. 
For example, in Lutsk, the majority were nobles, while in Kiev it was the clergy, one of the Brotherhood's major concerns regarded education. In the late 16th century, the Lviv Brotherhood rounded its own school. By the early 17th century, numerous Brotherhood schools existed throughout Ukraine. Ivan Fedorov established a printing press in Lviv with the help of the Brotherhood, which in 1574 would publish his first book, The Apostle. When in 1583 Fedorov died, the Lviv Brotherhood brought it and used it to make their city a center of orthodox book publishing. Although the Brotherhoods helped to develop a self-confidence and militancy, as well as the resistance, the Brotherhoods still struggled. Some of the issues were lack of funds, sporadic links with each other, activity limited to the goodwill as it depended on a few committed individuals, conflicts with the clergy as conflicts were often between the church affairs, money and theological related, and the Brotherhoods. The upshot of the matter was that the Brotherhoods, instead of helping to rehabilitate the Orthodox Church, often added to the anarchy within it. Since around the 13th century, there had been ideas of a union between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church, but feared that the more influential Catholic Church would engulf Orthodoxy, the matter was postponed. In truth, the Polish Catholics did sought union as a means to expand their influence and pull Ukraine and Belarus closer to the Commonwealth and further away from the influence of Orthodox Moscovy. Despite the Orthodox fears, it was them who pushed for a union. In 1590, Gedeon Balaban, the Orthodox Bishop of Lviv, infuriated by his endless disputes with the Brotherhood and even more by the tactless interference of the Patriarch of Constantinople, broached the idea of a union with Rome at a secret meeting of Orthodox bishops in Bells. Later, the conspirators were joined by Ipatil Poti of Volodymyr. This energetic, recently ordained nobleman and former Calvinist, together with Terletsky, became the leader of the pro-union country of bishops. These bishops believed that by entering a union it would impose order and discipline, raise the bishops' authority over the clergy and laity, full equality on the commonwealth. No longer they claimed, would Ukrainian burghers be mistreated in the towns of orthodox noblemen passed over in appointments to office because of their religion. Moreover, the bishops would also benefit because if they received equal status with the Catholic hierarchy, they would gain membership in the prestigious and influential senate. In return, for the guarantee that the traditional Orthodox liturgy and rites, as well as such practices as the right of priests to marry, would be respected, they accepted the supreme authority of the Pope in all matters of faith and dogma. At the end of 1595, Teletsky and Poti traveled to Rome, where Pope Clement VIII formally recognized the Union. The news of the Union of Brest in 1596 was not well received by the Orthodox community. Prince Ostrowski, for example, was infuriated by the manner in which it had been handled, rather than with the Union itself. In addition to lodging a formal complaint with the King, which was ignored, Ostrowski entered into an anti-Catholic compact with the Protestants and threatened to lead an armed uprising. Meanwhile, in all the Ukrainian and Belarusian lands, Orthodox noblemen vociferously denounced the Union in their local assemblies. Frightened by the outcry, the initiators of the affair, bishops Baladan and Kopitensky, deserted their colleagues and formally declared their opposition to the Union. A church council was called in Brest in 1596. It was quick quickly perceived that the ones present could not reach common ground, realizing the negotiations were pointless. The ones in favor of the Union publicly reiterated their intention and despite protests and threats from the Orthodox, they could not force them from their position. Thus, Ukrainian society split in two. On the one hand were the Orthodox magnates, the majority of the clergy and the masses, while on the other, backed by the king, was a former hierarchy and handful of followers. Consequently, a situation existed in which there was a hierarchy without faithful and faithful without a hierarchy. What had begun as an attempt to unite the Christian churches and then in their further fragmentation. For now, instead of two, there were three churches, the Catholic, Orthodox and Uniate, or Greek Catholic as it was later called. The bittersweet situation provoked an intellectual back and forth that actually benefited a cultural upsurge. The literary output of the polemical writers was not voluminous. By involving Ukrainian society in its first full-fledged ideological controversy, they helped it reach a higher state of consciousness about itself and the world around 
beyond it. As Blockade assesses, the confrontation with the Poles would eventually lead to a sharper definition of Ukrainian identity. By imposing on the old map of Orthodox Rus the boundaries established by the Union of Lublin, the pan created a historical and political reality that would later provide a geographical blueprint for the formation of the modern Ukrainian nation. A map produced in the 1590s by Thomas Mazowski showed the new border between Polish and Lithuanian Rus in what is now Ukraine and Belarus. Scholars believe that Konstantin Ostrowski supplied the material for the Ukrainian part of the map. The local term Ukraine probably made its way to the map due to the prince and his servitors. The word denoted a part of the land south of the new border, referring to the territory on the right bank of the Dnieper, extending from Kiev in the north to Kanev in the south. Another name used for the region on the same map was Volnia Ulterior, Outer Volhynia, which stressed the close link between the new Ukraine and the old Volhynia. Contrary to its original design, the Union of Lublin created new political space for mastering and exploitation first and foremost by the Orthodox princely elite, which was enhanced by the Union. These princes' actions, their invention, would eventually become Ukraine. The acceptance of the concept of the Rus land as a legitimate counterpart of the Lithuanian land was short-lived, as it did not survive the union of the Grand Duchy with the Kingdom of Poland. While the Rus ethnocultural identity was becoming increasingly established in the cautionists of Rus elites and commoners alike, as attested by the Rus-derived toponyms in Belarus, the political component of that identity was manifestly disappearing. Although the unions of Kreva and Orodlo showed clear signs that the Russianization of the Lithuanian elites had come to an end, the Grand Duke of Lithuania nonetheless helped produce a new type of Rus identity, creating the conditions for the first manifestation of Rus solidarity based on ethnocultural unity. Studying this part of Ukraine's history makes one realize the importance the Orthodox Church had in the maintenance of an identity. Of course, the culture and identity of today's Ukraine is not based solely on religion, but it was without a doubt an anchor during the difficult times that followed the fragmentation of the Kievan realm. As Plocky concluded, without a distinct political identity to support it, the concept of the Rus land as a legal entity was transforming from a political notion into a historical one. But, as the political component of Rus identity was losing power and its prince's status, the religious component seemed to rise the Rus identity. The local elites did not regard the Lithuanian princes as other, and they were often chosen to rule Rus principalities in preference to the Orthodox Rurikids. In Lithuania proper, Orthodoxy was confined to the major cities, but in Rus it claimed numerous members of the Lithuanian princely elite. That situation changed dramatically after the Union of Kreva, which required the pagan Lithuanians to convert to Roman Catholicism. Thank you so much for watching until the end. I hope this video was relevant to you and do let me know your thoughts on the matter and feel free to share any sources you may have. Hopefully I will see you next time and together we will look into the approaching Cossack era. Stay safe.